this topic, we're going to discuss carbohydrates, monosaccharides and disaccharides. So by the end of this topic, you'll be able to answer the questions, what are monosaccharides and disaccharides? What is the difference between alpha and beta glucose? Describe the formation and breakage of glycosidic bonds. And how do you test for reducing and non-reducing sugars? So what are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Their general formula is CXH2OY. They are made up of individual units called monomers. The basic unit is a sugar or saccharide. So if there's only one sugar, we call it a monosaccharide. So this is a very simple sugar. If you have two monomers joining together, it forms a disaccharide, and then multiple monomers joining together forms polysaccharides. Let's have a look at glucose. Glucose is an abundant and very important monosaccharide. How many carbons can you count in this glucose molecule? Yes, it contains six carbons, so it's a hexose sugar. Its general formula is C6H12O6. Glucose is the major energy source for most cells. It's highly soluble and is the main form in which carbohydrates are transported around the body of animals. Now the structure of glucose can be represented in different ways. You've got the straight chain where the carbon atoms are written in a row. Glucose usually forms a ring structure and if you draw the ring without the carbons it looks like this. So this is the simplified ring structure. Let's have a look at how we number the different carbons. The first carbon is always on the right of the molecule and it's below the oxygen. And then it goes in sequence after that. So one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth one looks like the branch. Take a moment to pause this and copy it out because you need to know how to draw glucose. If we were to look at the simplified diagram, where is carbon one? It's on the right, so it goes one, two, three, four, five, and six. So how is the ring structure formed? Well, if you have the straight chain, it curls around to form this ring structure, which is more stable. So carbon 1 joins to carbon 5, and they share an oxygen. So have a look at the results. You've got alpha glucose and beta glucose. Notice how at one point in that hexagon is an oxygen. So carbon 1 is joined to carbon 5, and they're sharing that oxygen. Notice how you've got two different forms of glucose. You've got alpha and beta glucose. We call these isomers of glucose. They're structural isomers. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, glucose exists in different forms called structural isomers. You've got two common forms, alpha glucose and beta glucose. Notice how the OH group on carbon one is either above the carbon or below the carbon. So in alpha glucose, it's below the carbon. In beta glucose, it's above the carbon. So a good way to remember this is birds beat their wings and birds fly above. Okay, so beta is above. Now this minor structural difference has got a major effect on the biological roles of alpha and beta glucose. You need to know how to identify alpha from beta glucose. So, which of these is alpha and which is beta? Alpha glucose is the one where the OH group is below, and beta glucose is the one where the OH group is above. Other than structural isomerism, you've got optical isomerism. This may occur when you've got two molecules which have got the same molecular formula, but different arrangements in space. The central carbon is asymmetrical, so if that carbon has got four different groups to attach to it, we call it asymmetrical. 
and it's got different arrangements in space, so they can form mirror images of each other. So we call this optical isomerism. Now what do I mean by optical isomerism? If you t shine plain polarized light through the different uh, different optical isomers, so for example one molecule and another, they've got the same molecular makeup but they form different isomers, you would notice that the light would bend either clockwise or anti-clockwise. So we name a molecule according to which way the light bends. So if it bends clockwise, we say that it is dextro. If it bends Anti-clockwise, we say it's levo. What do I mean by all this? If you um, take your hands and place them like this image, imagine that you've got two molecules um, of alanine. Now, alanine has got a central carbon, and it's joined to four different groups. So place your hands like that in the image. Notice how CH3 group is where your thumb is on your right hand and where your thumb is on your left hand. So we say that these two um, alanine molecules are isomers of each other. They're forming L-alanine and D-alanine. It's the same as here. You've got the central carbon, which is asymmetrical, and then you've got four different groups. If you were to put your palms facing towards you, the H's would be where your thumbs are. The CH3's would be pointing forwards and the OH groups would be pointing backwards. So they're forming mirror images of each other. It's like if you put your right hand up and you're looking in the mirror, the image that is, that is looking back at you looks like the left hand is looking, is up. So we call this optical isomerism. You've got two other important hexose monosaccharides. These are fructose and galactose. Fructose is soluble. It's the main sugar in fruits and nectar, and it's sweeter than glucose. Notice that fructose has also got six carbons. Galactose. Galactose has also got six carbons, so it's also a hexose. It's not as soluble as glucose. And it's got an important role in the production of glycolipids and glycoproteins. Now we're going to move on to pentoses. As the name suggests, pentoses, monosaccharides, contain five carbon atoms. So like hexoses, pentoses are long enough to form a ring. You've got two important pentose molecules, ribose and deoxyribose. The only difference between these two is the OH group. Uh, uh, well, carbon-2 has got an OH group with ribose, and with deoxyribose, carbon-2 doesn't have an OH group. We'll discuss this in more detail when we get to transcription and translation. Let's have a look at how disaccharides are formed. So when you have two monosaccharides joining together, they form a disaccharide. The two monosaccharides that join can be the same or different. When they join, a molecule of water is removed. We call this a condensation reaction. And the bond that is formed is called a glycosidic bond. The way that we name the bond is by stating the number of the carbon atoms between which the bond has formed. So in this case, it's between carbon 1 of the first molecule and carbon-4 of the second molecule. So it's a 1,4 and if you look at the first molecule the OH group would have been an alpha. So it would have been alpha glucose. So we say it's a 1,4 alpha glycosidic bond. So there are three disaccharides that you have come across, maltose, sucrose, and lactose. Maltose is formed when you have two glucose molecules, and it forms a 1,4 glycosidic bond. So the bond between the two gl glucose molecules is 1,4 alpha, or alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. Then you've got sucrose. Sucrose is when you've got a glucose and fructose, the bond is alpha 1,4 glycosidic. 
Lactose is between galactose and glucose, and the bond is beta 1 4 glycosidic. Now, how do we break down a disaccharide? The term hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means to break down using water. So when you add water to a disaccharide under suitable conditions, it breaks the glycosidic bond into its constituent monosaccharides. So we call this hydrolysis. The breakdown is very slow unless it's catalyzed by an appropriate enzyme. So when you build up so you join two monomers together, we call that a condensation reaction. When you break them apart, we call it hydrolysis. Now what is a reducing sugar? Substances that provide electrons to carry out reduction are called reducing agents. So this can um, be the C double bond O in some sugars and they reduce copper 2 plus to copper plus which forms a red precipitate. So the reducing sugars that you know are all the monosaccharides and maltose. So how do we test for reducing sugars? We use the Benedict's test. So all monosaccharides and some disaccharides such as maltose are reducing sugars. The test is known as the Benedict's test. The first step is to add Benedict's reagent in excess. Then you heat the solution in a water bath and if the reducing sugar is present, the solution turns green and then brick red. So a good way to remember this is you'll take one milliliter of glucose solution, two milliliters of Benedict's and then heat it for three minutes. Now obviously the um, volumes are going to vary from experiment to experiment. So just remember one is to two is to three the Benedict's reagent must always be in excess. So here's a simplified diagram. One cubic centimeter of glucose solution, your test solution, two cubic centimeters of Benedict's. You're going to heat it for three minutes. And if it's a positive result, it'll turn brick red. So what it's doing is it's reducing copper 2 plus to copper 1 plus. So it's forming copper oxide. Now the color of the precipitate changes from green through yellow, orange, brown, and then it goes a nice deep red, what we call brick red, depending on the quantity of reducing sugar present. So this is a test for reducing sugars. What happens if you have a non-reducing sugar? Will it turn brick red? No, it's going to remain blue. So how do we test for a non-reducing sugar? What you're going to do is you're going to add an acid. So if you've tested a sample for reducing sugars and the result is um, still blue, the copper sulfate is still blue, then you take, or the Benedict solution is still blue, then you take another sample and add acid to it. You heat it in the water bath for about five minutes so that the acid will hydrolyze the non-reducing sugar. And then you add alkali to neutralize the acid and allow it to cool. When you retest with the Benedict's reagent, you'll get a brick red precipitate. So the difference between reducing sugars and non-reducing, reducing forms brick red precipitate with the Benedict's test. Non-reducing, you've got to add acid, alkali, Benedict's, and then it'll turn brick red. So what have we discussed in this lesson? We've looked at monosaccharides, in particular glucose, and how glucose forms alpha and beta. Do you remember where that OH group is on the carbon for alpha? Is it above or below? It's below, and beta is above. Condensation reaction forms a glycosidic bond, and hydrolysis breaks down a glycosidic bond. The test for reducing sugar is the Benedict's test. And to test for non-reducing sugar, you add acid, alkali, Benedict's. And that concludes our lesson. The end.